Hello everyone, today we talk about Ukrainian history in the interwar period after the settlement of uh, Riga. So we're talking essentially history from the end of the Polish Bolshevik War, 1921 onwards, and the ensuing uh, rule in different parts of, of Ukraine, but still comprehensively the whole country of Poland and of the Soviets with very different outcomes, still dramatic enough in any case, in spite of the disparity overwhelmingly shifted probably the Soviet catastrophe, the whole the more and, and, and more, as we will see and we will make videos about that even more specifically by the way, and thus the nurturing, especially within the uh, Polish rule that had incorporated what we've seen in the previous videos, Galicia, what had pertained originally to the Commonwealth and later to the Austrian Empire, where in fact uh, Ukrainian national identity had acquired more modern physiognomy, let's say. And so the development properly of Ukrainian nationalism that would work, look at with resentment not just towards the communist rule but also the Polish one, and came closer to uh, Nazi fascism. So, uh, we have seen, in, as you know, recently I made a video about the Polish-Bolshevik war. Altogether, we didn't talk much about Ukraine there, but fundamentally, uh, we see the Second Polish Republic uh, emerged from uh, the, the ashes, in fact, of the Second Reich and the, uh, the, the Tsarist Empire, and partly, in fact, also the Habsburgic one, um, uh, lead, uh, led properly by uh, Josef Piłsudski, that had had historically a, a plan for Polish-Ukrainian alliance against Russia. Mm -hmm. However, more important for the country, uh, that was overwhelmingly uh, national democratic at that point and you know that Piłsudski himself had problems with the national democrats because he had a, a more decisive view uh, and of what Poland properly had to achieve but it could not however go without at that point also because of the same uh, instances of Ukrainian independence uh, properly without the annexation of what had fundamentally been uh, Galicia, right, Ukrainian uh, Galicia that uh, had remained, uh, we've seen it in the previous videos, largely at least in, in Vov, Viv uh, and imp importantly affected by Polish culture as with a Jewish presence etc. And so um, all the problems that came from the creation, ex novo, of, of a Ukrainian state uh, entailed somewhat a, probably a, a confrontation with Poland and the Polish minority, so the Jewish minority, in the city, whereas most Ukrainians were effectively the countryside person. And if, uh, so as you know, there were two republics, one in, uh, two Ukrainian republics, probably one in Kiev and one in Lviv. And Poland could not ally itself with Ukrainians in general uh, against Russia in a pretty stormy moment as you know where the, the civil the Russian civil war was not yet over there was still a, an intervention of the Entente from Western powers uh, etc. Uh, hadn't Poland properly destroyed at, at least one of the two uh, Ukrainian states because these together would have still been mm, from a condition um, of, you know, that could have been um, unfa unfavorable to Poland that wanted in any case to to include in its uh, in its state Lvov that was a symbol of Polish uh, culture and had to be secured. Also for many other, you know, international and strategical reasons at that point, as you understand, in any case, more territory gain at that point, the better it was, especially one that could be controlled as it would be effectively by Poland. 
and we will see better what the international balance was about for for this achievement so um, when the Polish accomplished the annexation of Galicia Pilsudski could ally himself with Petlura that was the, the leader of the Kievan state at that point but for the Ukrainian cause that at that point Pilsudski was supporting against the Soviets um, there was really not much to do anymore because the Kievan state alone would have been just treated as a buffer one by the Poles uh, and that didn't think they could, they could um, hold it uh, nor were at that point interested um, in it considering the, the broader balance and, and the general exhaustion that all these countries uh, were facing uh, by the, given that the continuation of the struggle was happening already on the enormous uh, disaster of World War I, etc. So these were states with a, you know, a limited autonomy in terms properly of war waging and so on. We have seen it in the video about the Polish Bolshevik War and how effectively the settlement of Riga was, was reached to last fundamentally up to 1939 in terms of borders and reciprocal uh, interaction, let's say. And, um, and this was naturally a big deal for Ukrainians because Petliura was at, at the head of a Ukrainian state that at that point could be salvaged just uh, with a Polish to a Polish alliance against the Soviets then instead wanted to march on Kiev as they had already done it in 1918 after that the Ukrainians had, had uh, rendered themselves uh, independent and and uh, as we've seen this Ukrainian states both in Galicia and in, in the Kievan uh, uh, region were fundamentally not happy of what was going on generally speaking because the, the mass of the peasantry was somewhat alien to, to to the international reality, right? They for for them it was just about surviving in a in their straits of war, of banditry, of invasions, of of occupations, etc. And they frankly didn't give a damn about the whole thing, uh, if not as, as, far as at least as far as their direct interests, most important ones were concerned. So in um, uh, Petliura in April 1920 properly considered Western Ukraine to Poland, right? Even though he didn't, he hadn't controlled it, but that was a fait accompli, and um, this could uh, open finally to the alliance with Poland in the joint attack on Soviet Russia. And naturally, Galician Ukrainians saw this like a betrayal from Kiev. Right, uh, but there wasn't really, really an option uh, uh, for Petliura in the first place because the Poles were too strong in the West, and uh, Kiev at that point was threatened by the Soviets. So probably there was no room in that mechanism for uh, preserve a, a statehood in the broader Ukrainian heartland for both the independentists I had, you know, dreamt in the previous generations. Um, and Pilsudski also necessitated the Kievan buffer state to, in order to defeat the, the Red Army. Uh, what actually happened is that uh, the, 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 the Reds had reoccupied Kiev again, right? And so um, we have seen it in the video that the, the, the Poles simply marched into Kiev, um, saluted by, greeted by the population etc. Uh, and this this war was a big deal because uh, it was dramatically easy for the Poles to, to invade, right? And to successfully march into Soviet territory before tides would be turned and had to retreat to Warsaw where in fact the, the Red Army uh, reached and was defeated in turn and so the Poles re invaded uh, Russia again. And this was a very, uh, well, as, as all wars are, uh, a quite risky gamble. Um, also considering the political situation in Poland itself, because as we've seen, Piłsudski had this kind of uh, 
capable authoritarian charisma that, uh, generally speaking, was much more active and uh, propositive and uh, decisive than what the broader Polish National Democratic Front uh, envisaged. Uh, and in fact, the Polish National Democrats actually opposed um, Ukrainian independence to court. Right, so even Pilsudski alliance with Pitlura was seen as fundamental sort of betrayal of you know Polish identity for some reason. But in that international scenario, frankly, there wasn't really again it was the most sensible thing to do. And so what the Polish National Democrats actually were waiting for, in a sense, or at least they they hoped in from a merely internal political point of view, was a failure of Pilsudski, which almost happened. In fact, when the Polish army retreated, by the way, the, the Ukrainian one of Pitlura simply also abandoned the Polish army. They fled back in, in the west, where they, in fact, the the, the Bolsheviks re reoccupied Kiev again. And 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 when Pilsudski came back to Warsaw, where the defense of the city was was set up, being set up, and was it was a desperate situation. Actually, he had to make a coup, also a bloody one, by the way, in order to repristinate kind of an internal political cohesion. Because really, at that point, the Red Army could have uh, could have mm, defeated the Poles, and at that point, Poland would have become the center of spread of communism into Germany. Uh, that was quite. Um, uh, turbulent at this point, as you know, and from there to the rest of Europe, and and the you we, we, we don't know where the the Red Army would have been stopped because, in fact, Germany was destroyed uh, at that point. Uh, the also the Western uh, victors were were really in, in in deep trouble between fascists and communists, and so uh, keeping the 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 balance in all this this thing was really. Uh, something I think the West has never tanked enough Poland for achieving. But in fact, in this scenario, as we will see, the the, the strength ratios that were being mm, uh, defined in in Central Eastern Europe were something very different, very distant also from properly what the Westerners uh, were were thinking. Just some enlightened minds like Churchill or other. Say there were many volunteers from the West, etc., that helped Poland. Uh, they shipped grain, weaponry, and all this stuff. But um, it, they essentially did it alone, and also, yes, for their own interests. By the way, because the Poles also kind of extended their control on lands that, including Ukraine, as we've seen there, or parts of Lithuania, or uh, or the same. Uh, let's say the same German, uh, uh, the German borders, etc. That were were not theirs, but that was a moment of important affirmation of Polish uh, independence, and uh, it was a state compressed between, uh, in fact, this giant of the of the Soviet what would if it was it would effectively become in twenty twenty two, like the Soviet Union, formally, um, and and also you know the threat of uh, re reviving of German power as it would happen in fact you know in 1939 that's essentially what the Nazis and and the and the, and the Soviets did uh, uh, with with Poland and the uh, the National Democrat Stanislav Grabski resigned as chair of the parliamentary foreign affairs committee in protest with at the alliance with Ukraine even with Kiev, right? Which, uh, again, if you think about that, is ridiculous. There was a Soviet Union, was a, an, an an enormous uh, monster, a weak one, a troubled one. It was full of of peasant revolts. Uh, the 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 country was exhausted uh, by World War the First, by the Civil War, etc. Uh, Poland had a great opportunity there, right? They could have really uh, topped the the Soviet government had an had they been successful in their march towards the north, so uh, why would not really help in Kiev in that sense? But for for some nationalists, this was too much in Poland. In any case, um, as we were saying before, Kiev was was uh, was open to the Poles in May 1920. 
would be lost uh, during the same year as quickly to the Red Army when when the Poles had to, to retreat. And there were naturally, in fact, Ukrainians that were also levied locally by the Soviets that would be sent to fight against Poland in Warsaw. Um, and uh, you know how the thing went. The, the Red Army arrived at the suburbs of the Polish capital uh, and also in Lvov, by the way, in August 1920. And they were crushed and pushed back. Uh, not completely annihilated, but still under retreat and still essentially with, with the Poles having the upper hand at that point, roughly. But the two, two, the two states were exhausted. And the, um, the, the, the Polish Constituent Assembly represented mostly central Poland, right? Was heavily national democratic. But historically, and as we've seen also in this series, in this series about Ukrainian history, the Poles, but in general, this is in Central Eastern Europe. Ethnicities are scattered and blended in some in large frontier areas, and the whole situation of Galicia was um, was evident. Saint Poland, after all, had been redrawn on the political maps after its cancel in, in uh, at the end of the 18th century. So. Uh, of course, this was a, a very different world from just the one of of, of ten years before. Literally, a a whole era had had uh, had turned, had changed, and um, the um, the the point of national democrats in Poland was essentially to add to the country just those territories that could be nationally assimilated to the Polish state, right? Uh, which meant, in practice, actually, that that is would have been whatever the National Democrats would have considered to be ethnically or and or historically Polish, right? And as we've seen, Galicia presented a, a quite uh, you know a, a dilemma there, uh, at least in a, from an objective standpoint, because it was essentially a, a superimposition of of different cultures at the same time. And the settlements in Riga with the Soviets in March 1921, so the, the peace essentially between Poland and, and, the, and the Soviets, resulted in the partition of Belarusian and Ukrainian lands. Mm -hmm. Also Lithuania, largely what it could be. Uh, Poland took most of Volhynia and all of Galicia, and agreed to the recognition of a Soviet Ukraine and a Soviet Belarus. So these were states within the, the Soviet Union. Having violated the spirit, um, if perhaps not the latter, of the Article 4 of its agreement with Petlura's uh, Ukraine, Poland in turn, its Ukrainian allies. And even at that point there was not really much that could be done had even they wanted that because you know uh, still having this Ukrainian buffer state would have brought to further instability uh, because uh, the either the Poles or the Soviets could have penetrated in a way or another would have been probably another war and quarrels on this uh, reality and so this state of affairs was fundamentally also uh, unavoidable by by some degree. So Poland showed between 1918 and 1920 to be a strong state in the region, right? It had, after all, won two wars, right? The one against West, the West Ukrainian Republic in 1918-1919 and the second one against Bolshevik Russia in 1920. As a consequence, the Polish state could afford to, in the in negotiations, to absorb Galicia and most of Volhynia. And as we were saying before, this was really the changing of an era. The political map of Europe had been redrawn in the center in the east after the collapse of the second 
uh, German, the Habsburg and the Tsarist empires that had left room for, uh, let's say, to, to smaller states that in a way uh, reflected the, from one side, the weakness of the, of the, let's say, of the main powers from which these this realities had detached themselves from and consequently also the independent, uh, independentistic uh, instances of, of the latter, which uh, contributed to still create a sort of instability in, in, in the areas. You know, there would be some wars in the interwar period uh, also among these countries, between Romania, Hungary, etc. There were um, interesting situations that were naturally coupled with, generally speaking, in, in the broader region as sort of uh, distress because these had been the uh, the defeated countries in a way or another. So they were historically generally less developed than in the West. They had more tensions, more unresolved problems, both politically, socially, ethnically. Uh, and thus, th this is also the reason why in some of these countries, at least, the um, you know political extremism spread and in very painful ways. What's important to consider, especially between, as we've seen here, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, is that this area, we recalled it before, uh, was not really settled by the Versailles agreements. Right? The, the Westerners had, had basically no way to intervene in the area. You know, the, 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 there was a major intervention, of course, during the Russian Civil War in favor of the Whites. Uh, the war was won uh, eventually by, by the Reds, so at that point the West bailed out. As we've seen, they also had their own problems uh, internally. So, what you know, the, 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 the settlements in the region was arranged basically in this sheer mm, s ratio, uh, strength ratios that, in the case of Poland especially, stamped incredibly and unfortunately this, the, the overflowing of the communist threat all over all over the com the continent. And when we look at areas like Volhynia, Galicia, of course we're talking about realities that, as we have seen also in the previous videos, had a, a historical tradition. Volhynia was already a, a, a policy in medieval times. It was a principality uh, in within the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and eventually a palatinate of Poland during the Commonwealth. Under the Tsars, it had been instead a so-called gubernia, right? And so what the Poles actually took in 1921 from it was just a part of such gubernia. The rest of historic Volhynia instead was divided between the, uh, in within the Soviet Union, between the Kiev and the Vinnytsia oblasts, of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The Bolshevik government, in fact, couldn't help but create a Ukrainian state in 1918-20. Right, we will see now what it would sadly become about, but still it was the recognition, of course, of a pre-existent Ukrainian reality that at that point could not be incorporated within Russia and had to be properly laid out as a, as a Soviet Socialist Republic within the Union, and not more than that, or better, not less than that. And so, um, then the, let's say, the, the, the Poles, by the way, interestingly enough, did not recognize um, any Ukrainian reality within their own borders. Mm -hmm. There was just the Palatinate of Volhynia, Volhynia meant a province here, the Voivodstvo Volinskie, or Volin, together with the southern part of the Polish Palatinate of Polesi. So when we talk about Galicia here, instead, they we're talking about the um, Ukrainian Alicinia, uh, Alicina, that takes name from Alec, that was, as you know, part of the old Rus, was a principality on the, the west, the, the southwesternmost, and uh, this had as we have seen, been the crown land of 
the Habsburgic Empire known in English at least as Galicia and let's say that in, in this regard Austrian Galicia had le was a historical reality but didn't have properly the administrative coherence of the Russian Gubernia of Volhynia comparatively it was just encompassing all these territories that Austria had taken from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth partition at the end of the 18th century that by the way were you know the the least you know the, the Habsburgs basically got the least from it most of it was uh, most of Poland was taken and Poland and Lithuania um, and the same Ukraine were, were taken by Russia then by Prussia and by the way these this Galician lands were of, of all the uh, of all the partition lands split by these powers like the, the more backwards like the ones that developed the least right were also administered in some somewhat a loser way as we've seen the Austrians led mostly to, to this Polish elite to, to do the job they were mostly agri just agricultural areas and so on in in the Prussian and Russian areas was um, I mean think about Warsaw right we're not talking about Kiev mu much that still however had a, as we've seen an important uh, influence on 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 Russian culture and in its own development in the seven in the uh, yeah the seventeenth and the eighteenth century, but I don't know Warsaw under the Russians was heavily industrialized it de decuplicated quickly in the nineteenth century its population, also the Prussian lands were of Poland that uh, th these were all retaken by the Poles now after the war uh, were also administered but the 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 Galician lands were just some had been some something different so they're also very very fair all as you understand to the same Habsburgic Empire was huge and uh, was mostly center of course in the in the west with with Austria and Vienna um, the, the 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 Habsburgic Galicia had included Polish territories to the west as we've seen Krakow even so the the former capital of the Polish kingdom in the Middle Ages but before it was shifted to 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 Warsaw Mazovia um, and the eastern lands instead so in this areas were, were mostly Polish the eastern lands were instead largely Ukrainian right well the towns however still in the east spoke Yiddish Polish uh, and the main city especially Lvov, Lviv spoke Polish um, so when the Poles defeated the West Ukrainian Republic, there was essentially this Galician reality. Uh, they they reacquired uh, those lands of the Commonwealth that had been lost to Austria, and that thus they firmly believed, also from we've seen it before, the national democratic perspective to be their own, and uh, there was at that point, in fact, not really an alternative respectively you know about Galicia Ki the Kievan region was was a bit more complicated um, Poland um, divided the eastern half of Austria and Galicia into three palatinates Lvov, uh, Stanislavov and Tarnopol that were known altogether as Malopolska Vzhodnia um, if I pronounce it correctly is eastern little Poland and um, it, it is fascinating because th these lands were historically the ones of the so-called Rus Palatinate within the the Polish kingdom so th this had maintained as we've seen an important um, recognition also culturally for you know in, in for, from a Ukrainian perspective in terms of their development and, and, and after the partition of the Commonwealth also for this greater Western influence that had enjoyed and also autonomies and rights prerogatives that they had struggled for to to, to achieve within the uh, Habsburgic Empire mm -hmm. um, so Galicia as we talk about here is literally these um, this uh, Palatinate of Eastern Little Poland as also as well as small parts of Krakow and Lab Lublin that uh, were partly inhabited by Ukrainians as well as we've seen because of course they, they were a minority but uh, they existed together with the the Polish majority 
so that Ukrainians in, in interwar Second Polish Republic continued to speak of Eastern Little Poland as Halicina, that we call here for simplicity, aside from how it was, they were called by the Poles and Ukrainians respectively, it's Galicia, but this is just maybe if, I don't know, if you're Polish or Ukrainian, you have heard just these names for some reason, but I, I think you know that w what we're talking about. Anyway, um, there was still a Western influence, of course, in this whole process, because the, Ente the Entente powers mm, were to recognize Polish acquisitions in Galicia only uh, against the promise of concession of autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Westerners didn't really care about Volhynia instead because those were traditionally Russian territories and so they were really something else, right? It's historically, uh, for how they have, at least for how they had developed in an administrative sense and so on and so also the, the proximity of the Soviet Union was, was a threat uh, strong enough not to you know, obviously to, to, to give too much autonomy to, to, to a land from which the communists could benefit at the border. So the Poles treated Ukrainians fairly well in this area. So this is more than they would have done if the Entente powers had not uh, asked for some insurance, uh, says about that. Um, what was happening instead in Soviet Ukraine? Well, Paradoxically, at the beginning, things were somewhat more positive even than, than in Poland, at the beginning. Why? Because the Poles still, doesn't matter how democratic they were, uh, you know, institutionally, formally, etc., but they, they didn't give essentially representation or properly uh, enough space uh, in, to, to Ukrainians as such, right? They, they didn't consider any any option of of, uh, of greater autonomy or independence of, of a Ukrainian nation within their reality. Um, the Soviet government was at the beginning kind of more lenient, but it would soon turn into what naturally communism is exclusively about, that is, brutality, totalitarianism, and eventually genocide, which in Ukraine brought to 5 million dead. Um, the, why, why this shift, like, why this beginning, say, better beginning? Well, first of all, the Soviet Union had enormous problems, if anything, just to properly govern, because the Bolsheviks had barely any idea uh, about how what what real you know economy and real people and real countries work like in the first place, and they starved to death more people than you know, what World War the first had done in the same Russia just out of sheer incompetence of pretending that applying communism and thus at the beginning they couldn't be too um, say too totalitarian at least with, with these big national realities like Ukraine that had been forcibly brought under Soviet uh, government it could create enormous probably had already created by the way during the Civil War enormous problems for the guerrilla think about Magno think about you know the the, the Red Army had s secured this air was not interested in letting it slip it away again so what the uh, the communists did initially was to essentially integrate Ukrainians uh, together with their culture in the in the, in the same Communist Party. Th this went on during the 20s mostly, which was a, a moment of important activity of um, Ukrainians in, in, Soviet, uh, in Soviet Ukraine um, because they were left some margin of, of autonomy and to the possibility, if anything, of expressing themselves in their language, for example. Um, the, uh, the great Ukrainian historian we talked about him that had properly revived the idea of a continuity also with the old rose and, and properly a popular identity 
of, of Ukraine, right? Not one of the elites, but properly of, of the people per se. Mikhailo Khrushchevsky had even been president of the briefly independent Kiev Republic and uh, invited to return to Kiev to work in Soviet Ukraine. And uh, there was uh, an education in the Ukrainian language. Most children at the time were educated. Um, there were books, newspapers published. So for a while things seemed to be better than, than nothing, let's say. For, for a while the Soviets didn't even have the force to suppress what had become probably the new uh, Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church in the country. Things began to get much worse not that in other areas of the Union had not been really bad already because of, of the sheer uh, inhumanity of communism, but um, properly much worse with Ukraine when the Soviet Union consolidated a certain power and stability and under Stalin, uh, Ukraine, uh, essentially Ukrainian culture and identity were, were denied. Right? The new church was banned U Ukrainian intelligentsia was cut and in in all Soviet Europe in, in those years there was no other country that suffered as much as Ukraine. The Great Famine of 1932-1933, as you were saying before, killed 5 million people. Um, the Ukrainian intelligentsia was properly killed by the communists in the purges of the uh, of the late 1930s so any cultural revival was crushed the country was basically depleted bled white impoverished um, and all the worst disasters that you you can you can imagine and what um, this this was going on in central eastern Ukraine, right? So probably what was so the Soviet part of Ukraine. Uh, in in western Ukraine, that is in Poland, things were at that point dramatically like were like paradise in comparison. And it's interesting to look at Polish policy in this point uh, at this point because uh, the Riga settlement among the other clauses had given that the Polish Bolshevik war was a uh, was a moment of great ideological struggle because there were really two different models of the world right the western and the communist one counterposing not to interfere uh, with each other probably in terms of propaganda right of ideology of saying making this form of you know um, uh, ideological offense uh, against one another in the meanwhile but it's obvious that while the Soviets were killing uh, Ukrainians en masse, uh, many of of many Ukrainians, uh, most of them Galicians, emigrated from the Soviet Union, emigrated to to Galicia, and this allowed uh, the region within Poland in the 30s. So as we've seen, where, where Soviet repression was of Ukrainians was occurring, become the unrivaled center of the Ukrainian national idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and naturally, the continuity between East and West continu continued. Um, and naturally, this did not end the uh, realization that Ukrainian independence had to occur right in both areas, just that in Poland there was much more room for maneuver, for political action. And this is what um, brought also to the development of Ukrainian nationalism in, in Poland. Poland was actually supporting the Ukrainian exiles from the Soviet Union. It was not creating too much trouble internationally, but was was welcoming them, hoping that this would 
somewhat mitigate the the strained relations that the country had with Ukrainians in general, at least showing it as a preferable option to the Soviet Union, which really at the time uh, didn't really <laughs> take much uh, for. But um, never, uh, in spite of this, the uh, Ukrainian national movement began to take very uh, very dark uh, characteristics in Polish Galicia. And this is important for, for a number of reasons. First of all, when we talk about communism, you know, that they fake uh, the, the claim that there is some sort of universal character to it, right? And this is, an, uh, you know, just an abstract, idealistic vision for which, yes, the revolution should be exported all over the world, but unfortunately, reality doesn't work uh, with wishful thinking and in practice. Um, any communist regime fundamentally operated from a, from a national center. In the Soviet Union, it was naturally Russia, and the same process of de-Ukrainization uh, carried out by Stalin is quite quite eloquent in that regard. Uh, let's let's not digress, but you you know what we mean. And nationalism, and this is less um, you know hypocritical. It it, um, it it has some universal features as well, right? For example the claim of the right of self-determination for each nation and um, also the the idea that um, nationalism fundamentally helps other nationalist uh, movements when they are recognized as historical realities which naturally this depends again on what the political reality instead actually is and there was naturally a lot of emulation in the process that we've seen in Galicia was going on from the uh, Ukrainian side uh, observing the, what the Polish elite was, was doing for, for the struggle of Polish independence so that this had informed also the, the means that Ukrainians were using for their own and in post-war world, I mean in the interwar period naturally nationalism was assuming some mm, characters that were inspired to the uh, fascist governments that were emerging in Italy, in Germany. So, mm, especially Mussolini was uh, a point of reference uh, in Western ideology in, in the West at the time for, for, for nationalism. And, and fascism properly is developed formally the, f the first time from there. Naturally, every country had a different type of fascism as a different type of communism at some point, or socialism. Um, but the Organizatia Ukrainski Nationalistiv, that is the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, um, was taking very precise uh, shape and pattern in, in, in this international situation. The organization was founded by Galician Ukrainian veterans of the Western Ukrainian Polish War. Mm -hmm. As we have seen, the, there were 50,000 dead uh, from the Ukrainian side in that war. Uh, these people were veterans of World War I, they had largely fought under the Tsars hoping for, for independence, they were really obliged at that point, but still they were armed. Th this is the, the thing that we somewhat o overlook also, speaking of the Russian Revolution and Eastern Europe broadly meant that for the first time in history the peasant masses were given rifles en masse, right, and properly acquired a, a real military experience in a in, in, in a deeply intense way, as before, you know, warfare had been mostly been about uh, a select part of the population, or at least that it was a, a great care, not spreading, let's say, uh, not not to distributing weapons uh, in in great numbers to to masses that could not be controlled. This is, was especially a a legitimate paranoia in, in a country like like 
Russia that was basically mo still about um, largely the, the peasantry, you know, at least in a larger scale, much larger scale than, than other countries. So it was really uh, also a reason of the Russian Revolution. So these Galician Ukrainian veterans had hoped by the also the, the, the collapse of the Tsarist regime, etc., to have their own state that the Poles had crushed, right? And some of them had fled at that point uh, to, to the West, right? So much that they had um, founded, um, you know, their, their, the, the same Ukrainian nationalist organization in Vienna in 1929 and this organization interestingly enough in fact included also exiles from 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 the Soviet Union at that point they were keeping to come especially at that point as we've seen in by the third in the during the 30s and it goes without saying that um, in you know the more democratic Poland allowed more margin for such uh, free uh, associations than than it was possible in the first place in the Soviet Union, considering the, the brutality of, of, of the means. Uh, but it took quite immediately some kind of illegal, conspiratorial and terrorist uh, feature. And there was um, also a markedly Galician character of it, in spite of, of the Soviet exiles from from central and eastern Ukraine, and the mm, the, the main motive, of course, be behind the organization of Ukrainian nationalists was what had happened to the West Ukrainian People's Republic, right? So they came mostly from that side of the aisle. And the reason why the organization had been founded in 1929 had been the Ukrainian nationalist reaction to the participation of some Ukrainian political parties to the Polish elections of the previous year, 1928. Mm -hmm. So the organization was mm, conspiratory in nature, right? It, it had the purpose of repristinating uh, a Ukrainian state and so to work the detriment of, of the Polish one in that sense. And, and more, by the way, because the Ukrainian nationalistic goal was to create an independent Ukraine that would stretch uh, across uh, enormous territories, even going beyond the, the ones of, of historical Ukraine, and that it, it should have been made up only of Ukrainian people understood also in a in a very narrow way that is uh, you know it still could be confused in a sense but still basically no no poles no russians no jews nobody right and so um this was uh as you understand a kind of a disturbing uh, precondition but also let's say historically it can be understood on the grounds of the, the frustration of tens of millions of Ukrainians uh, that were essentially the, the most important uh, minority in the uh, in the lands of the former Tsarist Empire, right? The, the Lithuanians had it much better in a sense. Ukrainians lost much more people, had suffered much more. It was a a great hatred, a sense of betrayal from 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 everybody, right? From Soviet genocide, from Polish essentially uh, lack of recognition of their own prerogatives or anything um, and this uh, disturbing character was well uh, outlined by the so-called Ten Commandments of the organization uh, one of which is dreadfully Explicit says, quote, aspire uh, to expand the strength, riches, and size of the Ukrainian state, and even by means of enslaving foreigners. So we're really talking about Europe of the 1930s, as we were saying before, and of a country that um, was feeling as surrounded by enemies because they would see as, uh, as a concretely, right, in order to, 
to achieve their goal of Ukrainian independence, basically any country that had uh, you know, a Ukrainian minority within it, so the Soviet Union, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia, as, as an enemy. However, in practice, the organization was just operating within Poland, and thus against Poland. Right, and mostly from, in fact, Galicia, as we've seen. And the nationalists would murder Ukrainians that were willing to cooperate with the Polish state, as well as killing those Polish officials and instead wanted to, to help them doing it. And in Poland, such assassinations brought to, to quite a, a deal of, um, of division. Uh, first of all, between Ukrainians and Poles altogether, but also... Uh, within partly the same the same communities. Uh, by the way, Polish repression was radical, but in this sense, kind of motivated, if not justified, by by such acts. And we're talking about um, thirty six uh, Ukrainian, twenty five Polish, one Jewish, and one Russian either assassination or attempted assassination by Ukrainian nationalists. Um, some notable names uh, among the Polish murdered were some con reconciling figures such as Bronislav uh, Pieraski and Tadeusz Olo uh, Olovko, which is meaningful uh, for, you know, the the presence also f figures that wanted to somewhat bring to to an end probably of the of the hostilities between the, the two sides and um, the Ukrainian national organization thought of itself properly to be at war with the Polish state mm -hmm. and as such they were seeking for external support and given that basically all the surrounding states uh, so Poland, uh, Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and Romania were uh, fundamentally not going to grant a Ukrainian state despite having minorities there. Uh, the nationalists sought for the help of the closest um, non, uh, let's say, involved country that was Germany, Nazi Germany since 1933. Um, so there were, as we've seen also, influences from Italian fascism. So there was a general sympathy growing in the 30s between the uh, Ukrainian national organization and Nazi Germany specifically. They thought that Hitler would help them in a way, which was a mistake because, of course, the Nazis eventually would rely on some Ukrainian national forces uh, during the, uh, the the Second World War on the Eastern Front, but also nationalist socialist ideology entailed, uh, as you know, essentially the extermination, the provisional extermination of all Slavs at some point because they were deemed by by the Nazis as an inferior race to the German one. And this was a huge um, game changer, by the way, in the moral uh, relations in that could, um, I mean, the moral, yeah, the ratios of strength that could enact in, in, in the, on the Eastern Front, because if, if the Nazis had not said to the Slavs, well, just help us for, for, a, for a while, then, but we will take you out anyway, because this is going to be German Lebensraum, well, you know, probably some something more could have been achieved also against the Soviet Union, as mostly the Slavic populations were uh, absolutely horrified by by the the, the 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 abomination that, of course, the Soviet Union had represented, and the the, the tens of millions of people properly wiped out from the face of the earth, the the the, the torture, the oppression, the terror, the misery the dehumanization of hundreds of, of millions 
uh, in one of the most horrifying ways in the history of mankind. So um, there is no surprise there was eventually even in this lens an initial support to the Axis because uh, of the most obvious realization that it doesn't, you know, you, you may w think that it didn't even matter to them what the ideology was, but simply, you know, Western Europeans were a more civilized people than than the whatever was happening in, in the Soviet Union and in, in the in the disaster that it was would have kept to to dig itself in, into right so sometimes you say well you know but Nazi evil kind of surpassed the Soviet one well arguably arguably because I'm not entirely sure this is true as a matter of fact but yes I mean we're not talking about um, acceptable ideologies it's just, it's just that you know when you also look at the numbers and you realize of course that the Soviets killed more of their own people than the entire uh, Second World War did well you know then you start wondering what what the hell you know what the world situation was really about independently from ideology at that point so we are very lucky that nor the Nazis nor the Soviets prevailed because frankly uh, you know, you can't put up the, the excuse of patriotism when <laughs> that you're just a, a terrible totalitarian regime that wants just to, to rule over, you know, half of Europe uh, at the least, or could, because the, the the goal was the world and just to, to, to make people live in, in, you know, either carrying out genocide uh, on a on a global scale, or in and or to to reduce people in a state of of radical moral and material misery, or both at the same time, and saying you know well, after all the the Soviets were just def defending their motherland. It's just you know the the Nazis were defending their own when uh, the Red Army uh, entered Germany. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. They were just two ap appalling, disgusting realities for which every single human being that even had nothing to do with them. Uh, today should wake up every morning disgusted for belonging to the human race just because they happen right nazi germany the soviet union any, any other totalitarian regime that has um, infested the dignity of mankind um, in its already quite troubled path uh, in all this uh, ukrainians were however as we've seen at that point more leaning towards the uh, at least the the, the the nationalistic party that was coalescing the, the Ukrainian independent effort wi from within Poland uh, towards uh, Nazi Germany, with, with which, in fact, the party cooperated during the 30s. Um, the connections with the, the German Abwehr are, you know, documented in the intelligence service of Nazi Germany. And, yeah, this is fundamentally it. So, then we will talk bit more about Galicia and Volhynia because quite quite dark things happened there as well over the years and we will make I think multiple videos on that for now we stop here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content I thank you heartily for listening to me see you next time Bye.